Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India I am Dr. Priyanka Singh, Assistant Professor, Department of Political Science, DAV PG College, Varanasi. And today, I will be discussing on regional organization. And in that, I will be focusing on European Union. This is my seventh lecture. In the previous lectures, I have covered the emergence of international relations as an academic discipline, the theory of idealism, realism, Marxism, social constructivism, and feminism. I have also covered the United Nations. And in this topic, in this lecture, I will be discussing on European Union. To begin with, first I will focus on the role of regional organizations. So, the growth of regional organization was seen with the post second world war. In the post second world war, there was also the growth of international organizations. The United Nation, IMF, World Bank, they all was formed to save the world from the scourge of war to maintain international peace and security and welfare of all. With the growth of world organization, regional organizations also proliferated. So, when we talk about international organizations and regional organizations, they are not opposed to each other. Although international organizations are significant because they have the responsibility to look after the welfare of the whole world, whether it is developed country or developing country or any part of the world. They all, the world organization or the international organization has the responsibility to work for peace and security for all, welfare of all. But the role of regional organization is focused on the growth and development of a particular region. So as the international organizations are important, in the same way regional organizations are also important. And regional organizations play a significant role in shaping the global political landscape. Although they are termed as regional organization, the region is dominant in that, but they also work for the global political landscape because they ultimately contribute to the collaboration and facing challenges collectively. So, the concept of being collective also get emphasized by the regional organizations. Regional organizations have some common set of objectives that is based on geography, social, cultural, economic or for that matter political ties. And based on these ties, they provide a kind of platform for the nations to engage in dialogue, to communicate with each other, to build relationship and ultimately all these things are done to have to achieve a 
common goal and that is welfare for all. So, a regional organization is basically intended to appeal to only a specified category of states. Their scope is not global in nature, they are not global bodies, they are regional bodies, but ultimately they contribute to, to the development of all. Now, what is the relationship between United Nations and regional organizations? Regional organizations exist to deal with international peace and security like the international organization that is United Nation. And they in a way work to achieve the larger goal of United Nations because as long as even United Nations also emphasize the fact that as long as the goal of regional organization is in tandem with the United Nations, they both can work collectively. So, the goal of regional organization has to be consistent with the principles and purposes of United Nation. They cannot go in some other direction. So, basically regional organization encourages the states to settle the local disputes because the problem that underlies behind these local disputes are well understood by the regional organization. So, before referring those matters to United Nation, it is better to try to resolve those matters at regional organizations. And thus, Security Council also encourages that the, those matters, the matters of the uh, local level, those matters should get resolved at regional level. So, Security Council basically utilizes such regional agencies to work for the settlement of local disputes. So, except for the actions against enemy states because they need a separate kind of provision, they need separate policies. So, except for working and taking action against enemy states, no enforcement action shall be taken by regional agencies without the authorization of security council. So, regional agencies can work for, can work against uh, those states, those enemy states uh, with as the result of the second world war, but they cannot take action against any other state considering that state as enemy state and making provision for them they have to be in tandem with the United Nation and thus security council clearly mentions that, clearly orders that they need to be keep informed of all the activities that are taking place by the regional agencies for maintenance of peace and security. So, regional agencies cannot take action against any particular organization or any particular state and then they can say that okay, this is the enemy state of our region. So, we have worked against that state because that goes against the principles of United Nation. They have to keep informed the security council against uh, about all their activities. 
So what are the provisions for regional organization in the United Nations Charter? So chapter 8 of the Charter of the United Nations provide constitutional basis for regional organization and the purpose is the maintenance of international peace and security. Although for maintaining peace and security, it is the security council that is primarily responsible. But regional organization can also be involved in that. Then article 52 of chapter 8 provides the involvement of regional arrangements or agencies in the peaceful settlement of disputes because United Nation as it works on the principle of liberalism, it mainly emphasizes on the peaceful settlement of disputes and in that it can involve the regional organizations. So article 53 allows such kind of arrangement. Enforcement action can also be taken, but that enforcement action can only be taken with the permission of the security council. And article 53 also creates a mechanism that allows the council, security council to utilize the regional arrangement to implement its enforcement measures. And this arrangement has been made with a purpose and that purpose is that involving regional organization can provide a better mechanism to understand that problem because if any particular problem is taking place at a particular place that reason will be more informed about that problem that what are the causes of that problem? Then the United Nation. Then article 54 of the chapter 8 of the United Nation mentions that regional arrangement or agencies should inform the security council of their activities. And what activities mean? the maintenance of international peace and security at all the time, whether it is the time of peace or war. Now coming to the types of regional organizations. So there are basically three basic types of regional organization. First is the security organization such as NATO. These kind of organizations have the basic purpose of security. They can also be termed as collective defense because they have worked on the for the for securing defense, defense mechanism. So under this kind of security organization, member states engage in joint military planning for common defense. Second is the functional organization, the organization which is created for particular function such as the Central American common market. And third is the multi-purpose organization which is more popular because these multi-purpose organizations are motivated to some extent by both kind of concern and they have wide range of issues. They are not only concerned about security, they are not only concerned about function, they have wide range of issues. Now what is the importance of regional organization? Regional organization as it is related to any particular region or for some common security purpose or for some particular function. So 
regional organization have a kind of tenden tendency which is very much natural that there will be homogeneity of interest homogeneity of tradition values because that group know each other better whether it is formed for security purpose whether for any func uh, performing any function or for any other purpose there is some degree of homogeneity it can be of any kind of interest or for that particular region or to maintain particular tradition or values the nature can be of any kind then political economic and social integration is more easily attained among fewer states within a limited geographic area than globally for example the countries of southeast asia they have some common political economic and social integration they understand each other better because they are neighbors of each other so whatever purpose they have that can be easily attained because the number of countries are fewer they have some commonality so this integration can be easily attained as compared to the international or global organization then regional economic cooperation provides efficient economic units then the smaller states if any particular state for example if like i quoted asean or for that matter european union if any particular country single country could not have achieved that much progress then being the part of that particular regional organization because the larger units can compete better in the world market then the local threat to peace are more willingly and promptly dealt by the government of that particular area then by some agency or some organization who are far away who are least interested in resolving that matter who are at a greater distance from that particular place so local threat to peace if in in case arises regional organization can deal with it more effectively as compared to global organization then combining different states into the regional grouping will maintain a global balance of power which in turn will promote world peace and security because these regional groupings will be characterized as one for example european union a group of 27 states this regional grouping will maintain a global balance of power because currently this world is multipolar where balance of power is essential and all the states are striving to maintain some degree of balance of power so to maintain the balance of power regional organizations have a very important role to play till now now it is the starting of 2024 till now we have not achieved the global authority global authority has not been established there is still the absence of central authority so in the absence of the global authority regional organization is the first step towards that 
in the process of achieving the global authority. Regional organization is the first step and the ultimate goal of all is what? If even if we establish some global authority, what will that authority do? It will maintain peace and promote welfare. Regional organization is also working to achieve that. So, the regional organization is the first step to achieve the global authority or world government. Now, with the regional setting, within the regional setting, there is lot of heterogeneity, although there is some commonality, but heterogeneity is also there. And this heterogeneity can be easily accommodated within the regional framework. But despite all this, we need to understand the fact that all the functions depend upon the nature of problem, what kind of problem is that. If the consequences of that problem is regional, then regional organizations can provide solution to that. But if the solution is, if the problem is not regional, then a regional organization can't provide solution to that problem. So now coming to the European Union, because European Union is considered as the most successful example of regional integration, regional organization. When we talk about regional organization, the first name that comes in our mind naturally is the European Union, because it is a source of inspiration, a source of learning for other regional organizations like ASEAN. Because European Union has put a successful example in terms of transforming the strategic tensed environment in Europe. We all know that France and Germany were having an animosity between them. The first world war, the second world war happened because of their animosity. And today these two countries are working in cooperation with each other under the garb of European Union. So, European Union has been successful in transforming the strategic environment in Europe as it is a outward looking body. It has its own foreign and security policy and it has worked to achieve a larger goal, a common goal for which the these countries that is France and Germany keep aside their animosity. So, European Union has helped in the expansion of democracy and human rights in Europe. That Europe that has faced 100 years of war, 30 years of war, it has been the most conflictual reason and today it is putting a example, the most successful example of regional integration. Europe has always been the victim of war and the two world wars as the name signifies world war, there the devastation done by the world wars was you know limitless. And to avoid any kind of third world war, there was a need 
to avoid the war. So, European Union is basically seen as a brainchild of France, the foreign minister of France, Robert Schuman, and the statesman of France, Jean Monnet. European Union, it, it is said that it has also its origin in the United States of America's policy to contain the expansion of communism. Because after 1945, the world got divided into two poles that was capitalism and communism, USA and USSR. And both USA and USSR was keen on containing each other. So, it is said that Europe, the birth of European Union is the result of the policy of USA to contain the expansion of communism. And USA is said to be the biggest push factor for European Union. And European Union was built to promote liberalism in the form of liberal international economic order to establish the zone of peace and prosperity. Now, USA can be considered as the push factor, but along with that, there were some intellectual inspiration also. First is Immanuel Kant. Kant dreamed of perpetual peace among European countries. Then Victor Hugo. Victor Hugo, in one of his speeches, once mentioned that a day will come in Europe when arms will fall off the hand on the ground in Europe because Europe was considered as the most conflictual zone. Everybody was at war with another. So, the main objectives of the European Union first was of course to promote peace to promote value system and the well-being of all the citizens of the European Union, whether that part particular person belongs to France or Germany or any other European country. Then to offer freedom, security and justice without internal borders. So, borders were made irrelevant because borders create division. Then they focused on the sustainable development and this sustainable development was based on balanced economic growth, price stability, highly competitive market economy, social progress, environmental protection, so, all these things were included within the ambit of European Union. They were also keen to combat social exclusion and discrimination. Because until and unless social exclusion and discrimination get combated, we can't think of securing peace. Then to promote scientific and technological progress. The European Union also aimed for enhancing economic, social and territorial cohesion as well as furthering solidarity among European Union nations. So, basically European Union aimed at respecting the rich cultural and linguistic diversity because European Union is a diverse society and everybody needs equal respect. And they also aimed for establishing an economic and monetary union with one single currency and that was Euro. 
Now coming to the evolution of European Union, how European Union evolved. So the first step in the evolution of European Union is 1952 European Coal and Steel Community. At that time, the six members were the original members. They were also they are also known as Benelux countries. They are Belgium, Netherlands, Luxembourg, France, Germany, and Italy. And to be the part of any regional organization or international organization, there is a need to put some part of sovereignty at compromise. So they, they renounced part of their sovereignty by placing their coal and steel production in common market under it. Because Europe was the center of coal and steel. So for economic purpose, the first step that was needed was the to bring to make coal and steel community to form coal and steel community with the code that metals which are used to make the arms will be used to make permanent peace because they set a common goal and that goal was economic in nature. So now the coal and steel won't be used to make arms they will be used to maintain, to establish peace. Next step was the Eurotom Treaty that took place in 1957. So European Atomic Energy Community or Eurotom was established by Eurotom Treaty in 1957. The purpose of Eurotom was to create a market for nuclear power in Europe by developing nuclear energy and distributing it to the member states. And if surplus is there, they can sell it to non-member countries also. The third step was the Treaty of Rome in 1957. So with the Treaty of Rome, European Economic Community EEC was created. The community's initial aim was to bring about economic integration first, then with common market and custom union. Among the founding members, then the merger treaty in 1965, which took place in Brussels. With the merger treaty, an agreement was done to merge all the three treaties that was held before that. That was ES, ECSC, EAEC and EEC, European Coal and Steel Community, European Economic, Atomic Energy Community and European Economic Community. They all were merged together under the single set of institution and that was known as European Communities. Then in 1973, the expansion of European Union started and Britain, Denmark and Ireland became its members. And by this time, the U Euro United States of America, which was the push factor behind the formation of European Union, European Union started challenging USA's hegemony in trade. So United States brought pro-US countries in European Union like Denmark, Britain. Because these countries were closer to United States of America than European Union. And they also stayed away from many of the European Union treaties with opt out clause. Then in 1981, the second expansion of European Union took place and Greece also joined it. In 1985, Sheshigan agreement also took place 
and with Shesh Sheshgan agreement, European Union became borderless. This agreement also paved the way for creation of open borders. There will be no visa will be required to go into these countries, single visa without passport controls between the member states. And most of the European Union countries abolished their national borders and thus Europe came to be known as without borders, borderless also known as Sheshgan area and it became effective in 1995. In 1986 again Spain and Portugal joined again the expansion took place and some new fault lines emerged and that was the con that was a kind of competition between north and south. The debate between north and south started because there were two groups of countries. Countries of south were not economically sound, they were termed as pigs, Portugal, Ireland, Greece and Spain. And in these countries, there was the influence of socialism. In 1987, single European act was passed and it was enacted by European community and it make the European member states committed to a timetable for their economic merger. For what? For the establishment of single European currency and common foreign and diplomatic policies. And this act also led to establishment of common market. Through this act, the countries got four kind of freedom. Freedom of goods, freedom of services, freedom of capital and freedom of people. Free movement of goods, services, capital and people. Then in 1993, Master's Treaty was signed. It is also called the Treaty on European Union. And it gave birth to the name European Union. So, the term European Union by which we call it is the term that came into vogue in 1993 through Maastricht Treaty. And the member states agreed on important changes to the structure and power of the union that was created. So, there was basically they were working on three pillars, European community, common foreign and security policy and justice and home affairs. So, European citizenship was created so that the citizens of any country, those who are the part of that act, they, are allow they were allowed to reside in any country and move around freely. There were also closer cooperation between police and judiciary. It also paved the way for creation of single European currency that is the Euro. It also led to establishment of European Central Bank and it enabled people to run for local office and for European Parliament elections. So, what are the advantages of Maastricht Treaty? As there was free movement of goods, services, capital, people, so it makes business convenient. It also makes business competitive. So, it was convenient even for the con outsider countries to trade with European Union because if they are trading with European Union, all the countries are involved. So, without European Union, it is not possible to trade, trade with 
27, 28 countries. It denotes integration of market with the potential that euro can also become a global currency. So, it makes possible for the weak economies to attract foreign in investment on the credit of stronger economies. So, it was beneficial for the weaker economies that in the name of the European Union, they can be also a major uh, instrument, major country of attraction for the foreign investment. Then monetary union, monetary union was established in 1999, which came into force in 2002. The monetary union that is for Euro composed of 19 EU member states. All the members of the European Union are not the part of the Euro. So, 19 member states use Euro currency, not all the members of the European Union. These are Austria, Belgium, Cyprus, Estonia, Finland, France, Germany, Greece, Ireland, Italy, Latvia, Lithuania, Luxembourg, Malta, Netherlands, Portugal, Slovakia, Slovenia, Spain. These are the countries that use Euro as their currency. Now, in the year 2004, the biggest expansion of European Union took place because 10 countries joined European Union. They were Cyprus, Czech Republic, Estonia, Hungary, Latvia, Lithuania, Malta, Poland, Slovakia, Slovenia. These countries became the part of European Union in the year 2004. Another major important treaty is the Lisbon Treaty, which took place in the year 2007. So, Lisbon Treaty basically increases the power of European Parliament as this treaty is an attempt to make European Union more democratic, more transparent and more efficient and effective. It also adds the charter on human rights. It also includes the provision that EU will have its own foreign and defense policy. Also the post of high representative was created. And the most important development in the Lisbon Treaty is the introduction of qualified majority. In the year 2012, European Union won Nobel Peace Prize for contributing to the advancement of peace and conciliation, democracy and human rights in Europe. In the year 2013, Croatia joined EU, but one very important event took place in the year 2020 and that was the Brexit, exit of Britain from European Union. So, now European Union is the union of 27 countries. Now, looking into the European Union's governance structure. First is the European Council. What is European Council? It is a collective body that defines the European Union's overall political direction and priorities. It comprises the head of state or government of the European Union member states along with the president of the European Council and president of European Commission. So, European Council is one governance structure. So, the high representative of the Union for Foreign Affairs and Security Policy also take part in the meetings of the European Union. And European Council that was formalized as an institution in 2009 as the part of the Treaty of Lisbon and through the decision of the summits 
which is adopted by consensus the european council works on the basis of that next is the european parliament european parliament is the only parliamentary institution of european union as it is elected directly by the european citizens those citizens who are 18 years or above that they can participate in the election process so together with the council of the european union it exercises the legislative function european parliament does not possess much legislative power why because all the countries have their own parliament also so there is limitation to the european parliament next is the council of the european union so council of the european union is part of essentially bicameral european union legislature the other is the other um, legislative body is the european parliament and the council of the european union represent the executive government that is ministers of the european union member states and in the council government ministers from each european union country meet to discuss amend and adopt laws and coordinate policies so the ministers have the authority to commit their government to the action agreed on in the meetings next is the european commission so european commission is the executive body of the european union which is responsible for proposing legislation implementing decisions upholding the european union treaties and managing day to day business of the european union the this commission that is european commission operates as a cabinet government with 27 members of the commission one member from each of the country and these members are proposed by that particular country and the final approval is given by the european parliament and among the members of these 27 countries one member becomes the commission president which is proposed by the european council and it is elected by european parliament then the european court of auditors so european court of auditors basically investigates the proper management of finances both within the eu entities and eu funding provided to the member states it can refer unsolved issues to the european court of justice so that european court of justice can arbitrate on any irregularity european court of auditors are appointed by the council after consultation with the parliament so th they have the term of 6 years and it can be renewed next is the court of justice of european union so european union has also its court of justice and this court of justice interpret european union law to ensure that all european union countries settles legal dispute between them and european union institution there is no confusion no overlapping it can be approached by individuals companies or organizations if they feel that their rights are infringed so each judge and advocate general is appointed by the national government that is the member countries 
then the European Central Bank. So, it is the central bank for Euro and this central bank administers monetary policy within the Eurozone. It comprises 19 member states of the European Union. The European Central Bank has its own governing council and this governing council is the main decision making body of European Central Bank. It consists of European board plus the governors of the national central bank from those countries who belong to the Eurozone. It has executive board and this executive board handles the day to day running of the European central bank. Now coming to the functions of the European Union. So, European Union basically focuses on free flow of people, goods and services. There is pooling of financial resources so that those members who are not economically well off or they are facing some monetary crisis, they can be bailed out. The European Union works for the promotion of human rights and environmental protection. European Union is also one of the leading donors of humanitarian aid. It also plays an important role in diplomacy and for maintaining, for fostering stability, security, prosperity, democracy, fundamental freedom, rule of law at the international level. But European Union is not free from challenges. It has its own set of challenges. There is right of neo rightist parties who are also Eurosceptic and they put a question mark on European Union and its value of democracy and human rights. We all know the case of Brexit when Britain make an exit from European Union. This Brexit impacted the soft power of European Union as well as questioned its integrity. A question can come to your mind that what will happen if, if France and Germany also make an exit. So, we can uh, from distance we can say that it is a very harmonious block, but actually European Union is not a very harmonious block. There are so many fault lines. There are different categories of countries. One is Europhobic versus Europhilic countries. Then old Europe versus new Europe. There are some developed and some not so developed countries that is core and peripheries, North Europe and South Europe. There are many fault lines. Now coming to the future of Europe. What will be the future of Europe? So, European Union has played an important role in improving economic conditions and it has also worked for raising the living standard of people, especially in the weaker member country, weaker members. But the future of European Union is uncertain because of the challenges that I discussed in the previous slide. So, regarding European Union, it can be said that European Union is like a moving bicycle. If it will not continue moving, it has the danger of falling. So, more integration is required. As European Union expand, differences have started growing. So, it can be suggested that European Union should go for multi-speed model. So, presently it is said that European Union is now forced to move on multi-track. It is not the choice of the European Union. Rather, it is the only option left with European Union that it should move on the multi-track. This is all about European Union. Hope I have cleared the 
your doubts, whatever you are having. And I have tried to explain all the aspects of European Union. Thank you. Hello, I am Shikha Dikshit. I teach psychology and I am with the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences at IIT Kanpur. Uh, today I am going to talk about what is health psychology. In the recent past, health psychology has emerged as one of the important areas in psychology. It is a field of study where psychological theories and concepts are applied to understand issues regarding health and illness. The two major themes which health psychologists are interested in studying are the themes of illness experience and behaviors associated with that experience. Uh, contemporary health psychology adopts various uh, and diverse kind of perspectives to understand health and illness issues. These perspectives include the behavioral perspective, the societal perspective and the cultural perspective. If we uh, try to enumerate the kind of topics that health psychologists study, <coughs> the range is very wide. To name a few of the topics, health psychologists study uh, cognitions related to illness that is health and illness related cognitions, social cognitive aspects of health and illness cognitive adaptation, uh, chronic illness and uh, adaptation to chronic illness, disability, stress and management of stress. Uh, uh, health psychologists also study topics such as health related quality of life, social support and various kinds of coping mechanisms that people adopt to deal with illness, illness experience. In addition to this kind of experience, health psychologists also study uh, health, health care systems, health promotion and treatment related aspects including doctor patient relationships. So, as we see the range of topics is very large. Health psychologists also use uh, qualitative methods and they study uh, topics such as narratives of illness experience as well as social representations of health and illness. So, uh, we see that the range of these topics is very large. However, this is not an exhaustive list. More recently, some health psychologists have adopted a critical health psychology approach. These health psychologists are, uh, they offer a critique of mainly of the biomedical and behavioral uh, perspective of health and illness as well as the methods and approach which is used to understand health and illness. So, critical health psychologists focus on the social, cultural and political aspects of health issues. If you look at the methodological aspects, overall health psychologists adopt uh, quantitative methodology, they also use qualitative methodology and many health psychologists use uh, the mixed method approach.